So the main focus of the webinar is contracts for difference where Oxford University have just recently, and I think it, it, it went live literally one minute ago, uh, a report on how contracts for difference, a well-known policy tool for, for supporting the rollout of new clean technologies uh, can be adapted to shipping. And we look really very much forward to hearing from the researchers uh, represented by Alex Clark go through the details and, 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 and enlighten us on how this can do. And I think it's, it's the timing is, is, is very amazing. I think right now this year looks to be an incredibly important year for shipping decarbonization. And to make progress, what we need are tangible and granular ideas that can turn our, our bold ambitions into real action. But before I introduce uh, Alex and, and give him the floor, it, it's my great pleasure, it's our great honor to welcome Baroness Bryony Worthington to, to this webinar. Bryony um, is a well-known climate campaigner working uh, as a member of the House of Lords and I've been leading a lot of the policy work in, in the UK and in global, globally on decarbonisation. She's also been very important in driving the thinking around shipping decarbonisation, both in her position as working for the Envi Environmental Defence Fund and at the Quarterture Climate Foundation. And we're very happy for, to have you here to give a few opening remarks. So, so Bryony, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for organizing this and for, for pulling this work together. Um, the context for this is uh, I became really interested in shipping when I joined the Environmental Defense Fund. And uh, during my time there, I was delighted to see a work stream established uh, that helped look at shipping with a new light. Because for me, this transition to net zero that we need to deliver needs rules and regulations and government policy to make it possible. We're definitely going to be seeing front runners emerging with new technologies and running ahead of the curve. But to get widespread spread uptake and for things to become commercially viable, you need policies and regulations. And shipping is unique amongst uh, the global sectors in that alongside aviation, it has its own rulemaking body and can set the kind of policies that are needed to help de-risk this at a global scale. And in de-risking decarbonisation of shipping, it can have a massive effect in general on the energy transition bleeding into other sectors. So I see this sector as hugely significant in its own right, but also in helping commercialize approaches that will be useful as we decarbonize other industrial sectors. So for all those reasons, I'm delighted to be a supporter uh, through my new role at the Quadratory Climate Foundation of the work that the Global Maritime Forum is undertaking. Um, bringing together stakeholders to have practical discussions about how we do this is hugely important, as well as increasing their voices in the IMO ensure we get the right policy framework. I'm also thrilled to be able to support uh, the Oxford Smith School, who convened a fantastic group of people um, pre-COVID uh, in a dinner format where we started to talk about what would it actually take to really de-risk this and to get investments at scale. And the idea emerged there of having a look at whether one of the policies we use on land um, to enable massive investments in renewable electricity could be repurposed into this context. So we talked about whether a, a contracts for difference framework, which is essentially uh, the writing of a long-term contract for people to invest in clean technology underwritten up to a certain value so that, that, so that it de-risks it and keeps it commercial by, by another entity. In that case, it's the UK government. But in, when we were looking at this, we were thinking about who could be the counterparty in the shipping sector. So from that conversation, we were then able to support this piece of work, which I know Matthew's going to present to us now. I'm hoping that this will provide um, evidence to those people engaging in the sector, talking to investors, talking to ship owners, shippers, ship leasers, all elements of the sector, to provide them with a tangible uh, example of how we can create financial support for people wanting to make this transition. Ultimately, I don't want to be sitting in another meeting being told, by a lawyer or a, or a shipping owner from a big family company who doesn't want to change, that there's, they don't believe that there will be subsidies to help them. I want something tangible. I can show them and say, here's how the money will flow. This is what's been proven to work in other sectors. We can translate this to make it possible for you to move in your sector. So with those words, I'd love to hand over now to the research team who took on the task of seeing whether this contract for difference could be repurposed I'm delighted that they appear to think it can be and have done some really detailed thinking with lawyers, with policymakers, with stakeholders to present um, some really tangible ideas about how we can move this decarbonisation transition forward. And with that, I'll hand over 
to the research team and thank you all and look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much for those, those, those remarks. And Alex, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, just to check, you can see my screen. Yep, okay, off we go. Um, so thank you so much, Casper and Bryony, for your um, very helpful introductory remarks. I've done some of my work already, which is great, but I'll kind of try and keep it as, um, as close to time as I can. Uh, I'm really delighted to be presenting an overview of the report released today on behalf of my co-authors at the University of Oxford Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment, uh, with of course a special thank you to our funder at the Quadrature Climate Foundation and Ronan Lam and his colleagues at the specialist law firm Pinson Masons for their help in drafting a legal heads of agreement for the contract for difference proposed in this report, which I'll come to in due course. So what have we aimed to do? Um, here we're focusing on a specific regulatory support option contracts for difference, um, and the extent to which it can help the shipping sector decarbonize by scaling, by accelerating learning rates and key technologies and groups of technologies, and drawing in private investment. We had three main goals um, in this report, the first of which was to understand in detail the options for zero emissions international shipping. Secondly, uh, to evaluate the feasibility of contracts for difference in the shipping sector. And then finally, to produce a workable blueprint of a legal text for a shipping uh, CFD. Um, this process, of course, uh, involved considering various design and implementation um, uh, variables um, and striking the right balance between transparency and robustness, as well as the credibility of enforcement, the effect on competition in the shipping sector, um, the appropriate scope and uh, eligible beneficiaries. So just a bit of context, I'm sure many on this call will be familiar where the shipping sector is today but um, it might help just to provide some, some overview numbers. While the, the industry is supervisory body and regulator, the International Maritime Organization has announced 20 fish and emissions reduction targets and some major shipping firms, notably Maersk, uh, which is the world's largest container shipping line, have also announced um, carbon targets in, in Maersk's case for zero carbon by 2050. The industry as a whole has not yet identified an accepted or workable pathway to decarbonization. And moreover, with ship lifetimes often exceeding 25 years, ships commissioned today are quite likely to be operating well into the 2040s, which makes the need to deploy zero emission shipping in the 2020s an imperative for the sector to align itself with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, and this also means that uh, the transition towards uh, net zero emissions, or zero emission shipping rather, must be realised essentially within one and a half generations of ships most, um, which underlines the fact that the coming decade will be crucial in developing, piloting and scaling workable solutions. Um, just to provide some, some, some numbers, um, the current target for the, for the IMO is 50% um, 50 absolute reduction in GHG emissions by 2050 against the 2008 baseline. Um, and even this fairly modest target is a huge technical challenge because the sector currently contributes almost 3% of emissions globally. And under the uh, most recent uh, GHG study by the IMO, which was released um, in 2020, um, emissions are under the business as usual scenarios expected to reach 90 to 130% of 2008 emissions. So there's quite a long way to go. And today's ships overwhelmingly lose, use liquid oil-based fossil fuels uh, and the kind of key alternative technologies are not by and large commercially mature and face numerous uh, market and non-market barriers uh, to entry. So in summary, um, Paris aligned pathways for shipping require very urgent acceleration and scaling of existing efforts. This progress can be in the interest of the sector in avoiding stranded costs and assets as climate policy somewhat inevitably tightens. But uh, overall, the first, first mover costs still outweigh the advantages so we need um, ways of helping the sector to move forward as a whole. Just very briefly, I'll go over some of the uh, technology options that we consider in the report. Um, there are several potentially viable technology, technologies for uh, decarbonizing shipping. Each of them is at a different stage of maturity in innovation and implementation. But these options can include batteries and also biofuels, hydrogen-based fuels, um, green hydrogen in order to be zero emissions, uh, carbon-based synthetic fuels, uh, nuclear and wind power, although not all of these can meet the fuel energy density requirements of larger deep sea vessels, which are the ones we're most interested in here, and each has its drawbacks and advantages. 
So as you can see, we exclude batteries from this point onwards, given that we are looking at large deep sea ships for which um, the energy density of batteries makes them essentially unviable in practical terms, barring um, significant breakthroughs. Um, just very briefly, each of these fuels uh, or fuels propulsion sources has its own pros and cons. Um, I'm not going to go over the, all of them in detail due to lack of time, but I'm very happy to come back to them uh, later on in questions if that's of interest. But the, the kind of key message here is that although technological advances have helped reduce the cost of some of the leading candidates for clean fuels, much more progress will be required for zero emissions shipping to become economically viable in the short and medium term. And as you can see in this figure, the costs of clean fuels such as green hydrogen and green ammonia are still more than double their fossil fuel counterparts, even with a, uh, a carbon price of $40 per tonne added on top. And the key barriers to the large scale private investment and adoption of, of these clean fuels that is needed are, are well known and include uh, perceived technology risks, lack of supporting infrastructure, lack of project pipeline, lack of stable and scalable fuel supplies, and uh, ultimately, most importantly, their cost. Um, and fuel cost alone is not the full picture. So uh, the cost drivers for net zero uh, carbon fuels vary by fuel type uh, and uh, are essentially divided into the marginal cost of producing fuel and the differential there, as well as um, upfront investment requirements, which can be divided into several components. And as this uh, helpful figure from the IEA shows, the balance between these two drivers can determine the composition uh, or the contribution of, of uh, different fuels to the total, total cost of ownership of a ship powered by a different, different fuel sources. So here on the left, we can see clearly the cost advantage of the status quo, um, very low sulfur fuel oil and uh, LNG, and the significant contribution of fuel costs uh, to ships running on hydrogen, ammonia and synthetic fuels, and in particular, the very significant storage costs required uh, for a ship running on hydrogen. Um, so these are all factors that we need to consider when uh, designing a potential contract for difference. Speaking of contracts for difference, um, what are they and what do they mean in shipping? The main purpose of, of a CFD, like any subsidy mechanism, is to create incentives to close the cost gap between an old technology and a new one. And unlike other support mechanisms, CFDs can in principle achieve this objective without unduly distorting the market and do so at um, relatively limited cost to government. Um, and a CFD is intended to mitigate market risks faced by suppliers of a new high cost commodity by paying the supplier the difference between a predetermined reference price, which reflects the old technology, in this case, uh, the cost of shipping fuel, standard shipping fuel, whether it's NGO or, or very low sulfur fuel oil, and a strike price, which is set at the value required for the new technology to be viable. Um, and the strike price can be set either administratively or through a competitive reverse auction process in which bidders submit prices and the lowest bid is awarded the contract subject to meeting uh, certain conditions. And then over time, when the reference price is lower than the strike price, the supplier has paid the difference, ensuring that the supplier receives a guaranteed minimum price for the duration of the CFD. And in most CFD mechanisms, if the reference price exceeds the strike price, the supplier essentially repays the subsidy. And the contracting parties are typically a private developer or investor. Um, and then on the other end, a government or government-backed counterparty responsible for making and receiving uh, payments. Before um, taking you through our, the design that we arrived at, um, it's worth summarizing some of the key stakeholder perspectives um, on the use of CFDs in this context. So we spoke to a range of, of, uh, of interested parties from the shipping and energy industries uh, industry associations, government, financial institutions, as well as independent research institutions and NGOs. Um, I won't take you through all of our findings, but just to summarize some of the really um, key points, most respondents did have an opinion on which technologies were most likely, likely to succeed. And hydrogen was seen as easy to produce due to the small number of steps, but also considered to be problematic due to the difficulty of storage and transport. Um, and the majority favored green ammonia as the fuel of choice, despite the safety concerns associated with handling, handling it, although these have been dealt with up to now, um, given that ammonia is uh, internationally traded. Relatively few mentioned synthetic fuels, and those who did mostly saw them as an interim measure, allowing existing ships to run on green fuels. And uh, few saw nuclear as an option, at least for now, except potentially as a source of clean energy for green ammonia. Um, when it comes to policy instruments, most respondents saw CFDs as potentially a viable policy instrument for shipping, 
and most expressed a preference for a, a simple CFD looking at fuels only. And we'll come back to this in a minute. Um, but there were there were cautions from um, from a fuel provider with CFD experience um, that at least at the early stages there must be uh, auctions need to be used with caution, not least um, since at an early stage uh, they can the use of auctions can discourage competition with new players likely to have difficulty competing without having existing uh, infrastructure uh, and established buyers. And this has also been a concern for uh, renewable CFDs in the past. Um, it's important to note that although a lot of respondents across all groups saw a carbon price as inevitable slash desirable, um, that these measures can be complementary and um, our analysis really is without prejudice to the source of funds used to, to, um, to pay for a CFD. So these things can certainly operate together. Um, I will just skip over this quite briefly and then come back to it, but um, a, an interesting debate that we grappled with uh, was addressing the uh, possible spectrum of CFDs in covering just the cost of fuel um, versus covering all incremental um, cost elements associated with uh, building and operating a, uh, a zero emission ship. So that's not just the fuel, but also uh, required um, storage elements uh, as well as additional capital expenditures. Um, so it, by and large, a fuel only uh, solution was preferred by those we spoke to because of its simplicity. Um, but there, are, um, there were opinions that saw a total cost of ownership option as potentially better for competition and for making progress on the non-fuel components uh, of key technologies required um, for zero emission shipping to be viable. And then just finally, very few of our respondents saw the IMO as the most likely party to move quickly on introducing a CFD in the short term, mostly due to institutional constraints and the slow pace of change um, at the organization. But many also saw that if CFDs were shown to be successful by other national or regional bodies, then ultimately the IMO would need to take on this role to ensure the principle of uh, creating and maintaining a level playing field. So the general sentiment was to start elsewhere um, and move to the IMO as quickly as, as possible. In the last few minutes, I'll just walk you through our CFD blueprint. And of course, there's much more detail in the report that I can't go into here. Um, but just briefly, um, we ultimately ended up designing two different versions, one a fuel-only uh, CFD and one intended to cover total cost of ownership. The fuel-only uh, CFD is essentially a contract for the supply and use of zero carbon fuel on a qualifying ship. And the logic here is that fuel dominates operating expenditure, but we should note that depending on the, how the price, the strike price is set, administratively or otherwise, um, a fuel-only CFT can also, in principle, cover other incremental costs, uh, depending on, on um, how competitive bids are. The reference price that we chose was marine gas oil bunker fuel. Um, and the, the, in order to receive the subsidy, you need to provide proof that um, the fuel is zero carbon and proof that it's used on a ship, both of which are possible in the current environment. And it's open to any entity, essentially, whether it's a financial institution, fuel supplier or shipping firm, as long as they can demonstrate uh, proof of both of these elements. Um, a total cost of ownership version is the contract for supplying and using a ship with zero carbon propulsion and intended to cover the incremental capex and opex as compared to a standard vessel. The reference price would be the benchmark capital expenditure and operating expenditure for a standard ship operating on, on NGO fuel or, or VL SFO fuel. Um, and this would require different benchmarks for different ship types and sizes since the costs associated with, with these with different types and sizes are different. Um, this is just a visual uh, providing a stylized example of a fuel only CFD. Um, so the shaded area is the cost to government of meeting the difference between the reference price um, and the strike price for green fuel. And this representation, the strike price in orange, um, happens to reflect the cost of producing green hydrogen, but this could equally reflect the cost of producing other fuels. And a total cost of ownership version would look fairly similar to this, except with a, um, a more complicated and potentially less variable reference price. Um, the, each, each of these has their own sort of pros and cons. Um, so the fuel only one is transparent and it's simple. It's agnostic on the, the type of bidder and potentially because of its simplicity could attract more interest and, and therefore have a lower risk of failing as a policy. The reference price is clear and liquid. 
Um, it does not distort the level playing field insofar as, um, as liquid fuel is, uh, is considered to be um, at least the medium term future of the shipping industry. Uh, and it can also be aligned with the industrial strategies of countries interested in building up their own domestic green fuel supply industries. Uh, on, the, on the other end, it's not fully technology neutral and it's, it's biased towards liquid fuels. So um, a fuel only CFD would have trouble supporting, for example, um, uh, nuclear based uh, fuel sources. It can also incentivize incrementalism and there is a risk of reversion to standard fuels, all of which need to be dealt with in the design of the CFD. Um, on the, the TCO version, the total cost of ownership version, the advantage is it's more technologically neutral. It subsidizes all the associated, associated incremental costs and so on. But the reference price is less liquid and hard to identify. You need separate prices for each ship variant. And it's a, a more complicated process for a bidder to estimate all of these costs ahead of time. Uh, and therefore, there might be less interest in the CFD with a corresponding higher risk of it, of it failing. And for the same reason, it may advantage larger firms. Um, I'll be closing in a couple of minutes, but uh, just to take you through the key parameters of the, the draft CFDs that we arrived at, um, these are the key parameters that needed to be uh, specified. And what we, where we ended up is um, we proposed the administrating body be the European Union, um, because there's a, a relatively high chance of this sort of instrument making it through uh, the policymaking process in the short term, although it could be replaced with any appropriate uh, body. Any um, company is eligible to bid, any route is eligible, um, as long as it includes a port within the EU or the jurisdiction of choice. Uh, only zero carbon fuels are eligible, that means 100% zero carbon on a life cycle basis. Um, the reference price we've chosen to be a two week average of um, MGO prices in the five largest EU bunker ports, with the strike price initially set administratively to avoid uh, potentially putting um, uh, emerging businesses out of business. Um, and then finally, to make sure that it's enforceable, a performance security to be lodged with the administrati administrating body is required at the start. Um, so just to conclude, uh, in our report, I think we've, we've shown that CFDs and shipping can work if designed properly, and certainly can help to um, accelerate the viability of competing fuel options required to reach net zero. They also offer a relatively simple mechanism for allocating subsidies such that they can draw in private investment and they're paid on the basis of deployment, which can help um, uh, make progress down the kind of key technology experience curves required to bring down the costs of, of, of these key technologies. And finally, the parameters can be tailored to suit the case, uh, whether, uh, whether a CFD is run on a national basis, as it has been for offshore wind in the UK, or a regional basis at the EU, Eventually, we do, we do think it's desirable to be for this to be implemented at the IMO. Um, obviously, there's a lot more detail to go into there, but I don't have time for that. Um, thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to further discussion and your questions. Thank you so much, Alex. I think for a very clear and uh, and, and concise uh, presentation of the findings of the report. I know it's a very long report and it's very grand, a lot of very, really interesting uh, detail. So my colleague Lau has just put a link to the report in the chat. So you have an opportunity to explore it even further uh, and get even more of the details. Uh, I can see that there's also some questions coming in the chat and uh, please do continue to, to put your questions there. Some of the questions are more related to ship technologies uh, and viability of those. And I know Alex is not a naval architect and not an expert in engine design. So, so I think they're really good questions, but I won't post them to, to Alex because we really want to focus on, on the report and the role of, of CFDs. Uh, I know there's a lot of other information out there on, on the technical uh, feasibility of some of these engine technologies. So I can just encourage you to, to explore those. But Alex, one of the questions that, that, that came in relates to, to the, the point that Brian also made about CFDs being used in other industries. Uh, so the question goes, are there examples of CFDs being used at this the scale that you're envisioning in, in the report by the EU or potentially by other governments? So basically, has this actually been carried out or is it just an academic exercise, uh, wishful thinking? Thank you. Um, I won't pretend to have kind of done an exhaustive review of all CFD and CFD-like uh, instruments that have been used in the past, but um, the clear, clear example is the use of CFDs uh, for the offshore wind industry in the UK, which, subject to several caveats, um, has been largely a success and has been credited with helping bring down 
uh, the cost of uh, electricity from offshore wind turbines quite significantly in, in a shorter period of time than expected. Um, so it's, it's definitely got precedent. Um, to my knowledge, it hasn't been implemented uh, at the EU level, uh, certainly not in, in this industry. Um, although the, the, the concept of CFD is, is quite familiar to, um, to EU policymakers and is being thrown around, as far as I am aware, currently um, as, as part of the uh, mix of potential policy options. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a it's a well tried and tried and, trust and tested instrument, not in this context, um, but uh, a lot of the uh, design elements are, are readily usable when when it comes to designing a version that can work for shipping. I'm sure yeah. Miami may have something to add. Well, I, I, Alex, I was only going to mention that it might be helpful for people to know that um, the concept of contracts for difference in the UK emerged from. Um, experience in commercial contracting um, within the energy sector. So contracts for difference underwritten for different reasons were a standard way of progressing when you had variable costs. And it, it was really the electricity sector in the UK who understood that process and understood that financing mechanism and then adapted it for the zero carbon transition. And it was a very flexible way of enabling the government to set different buckets of CFDs to achieve different technological investments. And it, it's proven very good at bringing things down the cost curve um, in certain, certain parts of the transition. So it, it, it does emerge from the commercial contracting. It, it wasn't something that was just invented by civil servants. Thank you, Brandy. And, and just to build on that, uh, they were also been used in, in several other EU member states. Uh, so at the national level, we, we've seen experiences exactly, as you say, in the, in the energy sector and renewable electricity. Um, one thing I just wanted to, to ask you, Alex, because one of the things that you mentioned in, in your presentation was how CFDs might complement other uh, policy instruments. You had the example of, of a carbon levy potentially raising the funds that could then be allocated uh, through a CFD. You also talked about how the CFDs could be tailored to, to specific routes or specific, specific national geographies. And, and, and maybe you can, you can comment a little bit on, have you looked at it when you looked at the, at the total cost of ownership, whether there are other policy options that could help support some of, the, those, deep, some of those extra costs, for instance, in investing in a, in, in a ship running on, 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 on ammonia or another, or, or hydrogen, another new engine technology. Are there other tools in the toolbox that could complement? The, the fuel only CFD to, to try to, to de-risk those investments. Is that something you looked at? Thank you, Casper. Yes, it is something we looked at, although not, not in as much detail as, um, as the respective fuel only and, and TCO CFDs that I outlined. It's quite possible to have a, a hybrid um, option where you've got a fuel only CFD that's meeting the, the incremental fuel costs combined with other incentives, whether they're you know, R&D, uh, incentives or direct subsidies for capital expenditures, um, which may be more workable at the IMO level, given that there's so much difference between jurisdictions. Although um, I'm, I'm sure uh, Brian would have uh, her own comments on, on that point as well, uh, because um, although there is a lot of uncertainty over um, non-fuel options, I say non-liquid non fuel options like nuclear, like wind and so on, um, if, you know, it might be an undesirable outcome for a fuel-only CFD to essentially um, divert funding that may be going to uh, fairly long shot, but potentially very uh, high impact options like that in the long term. So it's important to be careful. Thank you so much, Alex. And, and, and now, because we really wanted to also get kind of the private industry uh, outside perspectives on whether this is something that could, could, could work in practice. So we assembled uh, a panel that will uh, comment and, and, and give their reflections on, on the proposal to, to use uh, CFDs for shipping. So I'll just briefly introduce the, the panelists before I will call on our first panelists to, to take the floor. So representing and speaking from a ship owner's perspective, we have Christian Ingerslo. Uh, he is the CEO of Merce Tankers, a company that's very, uh, ambitious in terms of, of leading the decarbonization of shipping. We have Sami Fentenbrock, who is Vice President for Projects and Portfolio in Yara Clean Ammonia uh, Unit. So Yara is a producer of ammonia and have made recently some very ambitious statements in terms of turning some of their production into, into pure green ammonia production and, and thereby positioning themselves as a potential supplier of fuels to the shipping industry. Uh, 
We also have Dominic, Dominic Englert, who is an economist from the World Bank. He has been leading the development of a couple of reports that have been published uh, within the, the last couple of months, especially looking at how the green energy transition in shipping can help create jobs and growth opportunities globally, especially looking at the potential in developing economies uh, and, and emerging economies. So they will provide their, their initial reflections uh, on the report presented. And the first panelist I'll call on is Christian. So please, Christian, take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having us. And uh, thank you to Oxford University for a very uh, inspiring report. Uh, before I start, I just want to mention that while I share the Maersk brand and the same light blue color, I am for all practical purposes an independent company uh, that just happens to be owned by the same owner. Uh, so I'm happy to take all that glory, but I am not representing the container line. Um, let me start with the task at hand. Uh, we need to get to net zero in 2050. Uh, it's just a question of when we realize this and get our act together. This is not something that we decide. Society decides the pathway to decarbonization, and that will be zero emissions by 2050. This is the period we have to put the needed policies in place. Now, the world fleet will be replaced over the next 30 years. So if we can get our act together and get regulations right within the next five years, then we'll have a transition to zero emission shipping without hardly any cost to society. But the market simply cannot solve this challenge today because zero emission fuels are too expensive relative to traditional fuels. And that creates a competitiveness gap and a carbon lock-in. And the market is the most important tool that regulators have to solve this challenge. Regulators will not choose the future technology and regulators will not dictate which fuels to use, but they should dictate mechanisms that allow the market to solve it. That's why uh, I and we believe that we need a carbon price to close the competitiveness gap between fossil fuels and zero emission fuels that are now emerging and to fund the difference in cost. A carbon price really provides a budget to fund and de-risk the first projects. And it also helps fund projects in developing nations within the same area. I simply cannot see how we can avoid market-based measures. Of course, this is being discussed at the IMO, also recent at the MEPC meeting, but unfortunately focus here seems to be on what is possible rather than what is needed. And to me, this is where the EU has an important role to play as a front runner and a catalyst of global change. So to me, the task and our ask is clear. Please set a meaningful price on carbon, use the initial proceeds to assist the transition and then lean back and see how the market solves this important challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. I think some very important points. We need to get to net zero by 2050, and we have a five-year window to minimize the cost of society and, and even to eliminate those costs. And a carbon price combined with measures such as CFDs can help de-risk and get the first projects off the ground. I think that's very, very clear. Uh, Sammy, from a, from a fuel producer, potential fuel producer perspective, What's the role of policy and, and the potential impact of a CFD for African shipping fuels? Yes, uh, thanks for giving us a couple of minutes to talk about this, uh, Gasper. So uh, you kindly introduced us and the clean ammonia unit, uh, which, which is focused on shipping fuel. But uh, in a way, also don't worry. What I will say today is also applicable for the other climate neutral uh, fuels. So I'm from a fuel producer perspective, when you look at technology, uh, which is often based on hydrogen, we can safely say that that does not need to be reinvented, right? It needs to be optimized and more importantly, scaled up. Same for infrastructure. Uh, and I've taken again the example of the fuel of uh, ammonia. Uh, the infrastructure is there. It does not need to be reinvented. It will need to be scaled up. But the infrastructure, like the tanks and plants you see uh, behind me on the picture, they are globally distributed. Uh, there is a global network and often very close to, to bunkering hubs for shipping uh, today. So in that sense, uh, my company, other companies are working on the first zero fuel or zero carbon fuel projects. Uh, we do that in Norway, in Australia and the Netherlands, to give an example. But despite very good progress, none of the projects have reached FID. And, and why didn't they reach final investment decision yet? 
Exactly, because we we lack in a way uh, the market side right, or the market demand to make this project uh, fully financially viable because they are very capex intensive and they kind of embed the first mover disadvantage that the OPEX, which is in this case renewable electricity, will only get uh, lower in the future. So to overcome basically that first mover uh, disadvantage, we need to uh, look at policy instruments. And having a look at, for example, EU and ETS at the carbon price of 50 to 60 uh, euro per ton, uh, we know that this is by far not enough, as illustrated in the study, uh, to compensate uh, for the difference between fossil and, uh, and uh, climate neutral fuels. If we also look at IMO, uh, what recently came out, or at the leaked drafts of the Maritime Directive in Europe, we see carbon intensity targets per ton mile or per ton of fuel. But we see also that these targets are quite far uh, down the road before they decrease uh, significantly. And hence, there is not really a strong momentum or a drive uh, to support early development of the truly zero carbon or climate neutral fuels at scale. And that's where we believe that the contracts for difference really uh, can make the difference in, uh, in, in this case to really help the first movers go to scale and ensure the full value chain from energy producer uh, over bunkering uh, up to shipping, uh, these instruments can be, can be critical and um, they will keep it at the same time, uh, obviously a commercial game, which is also important. So as uh, my colleague from Mesh Tanker said, the market will continue uh, basically uh, to play. So we see really CFDs as something in parallel rather than in series uh, to this intensity targets, right? Because they are really needed um, to, to get uh, much earlier uh, moving on, uh, on the alternative fuels. Uh, so for us, that's a, that's a very important message that we would uh, uh, underwrite um, to support the very early um, market signals that, that we see today. Thank you, Sammy. I, th I think very important we are in a position where we need to scale up. You have the technologies, you know how to produce it, but we need the market demand to get to the final investment decisions. And here, CFDs can really make a difference. Uh, I think that's very successfully put. And I also really would like to emphasize your point about CFDs as part of some of those policy measures that are complementary to some of the other things that are working. So we should work on, on different policy measures to, 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 to accelerate the transition that we know needs to happen. But, but Dominic, is this something that will only be a benefit to, uh, to companies such as Yara with operations in Australia, Norway, or, or the Netherlands currently? Or is this something that has a more global, uh, global opportunity? I know you've done a lot of work, so maybe you can introduce uh, some of the key findings from that work. Of course. No, thank you very much, Kaspar. And, and let me build on what Christian and Sami have said already. The World Bank is not a um, regular commercial bank. We are a multilateral development bank. So we care about climate change, but we also care about the economic development of our client countries, basically all um, developing countries around the world. And while I was reading through the report, I was wondering how can the idea of contracts for difference be leveraged in the context, in the context where the world as a whole needs to address climate change and many countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia um, uh, need uh, to develop economically as well. And in my opinion, contracts for difference could, be, uh, could become part of a development enabling virtual, uh, virtual circle for zero carbon shipping. And what do I mean by that? Anybody who has been following the IMO negotiations recently um, knows that the impacts of zero carbon shipping on states, especially on developing countries, is a very important paint, uh, point of the overall debate. And some stakeholders here uh, legitimately um, uh, fear that shipping's energy transition may happen at the expense of developing countries, for example, in terms of increased um, uh, transport costs. However, a very recent analysis by us at the World Bank shows that decarbonizing shipping can also offer tremendous business and development opportunities to these developing countries. Because with conventional shipping, countries needed significant oil reserves to take part in the global bunker fuel market. With zero carbon shipping in the future, it's the renewable energy resources like solar or wind that will matter most and compared to oil, many more developing countries have uh, these resources and can take advantage of these. 
However, to leverage this potential, zero carbon bunker fuels need to close the competitiveness gap with fossil fuels, as already mentioned by Christian and by Sami. And this can uh, most cost effectively be done through a market based measure like putting a carbon price on bunker fuels. And this is where we could think about creating a virtual circle of zero carbon bunker fuels market-based measures, revenue recycling, and contracts for difference. And it would work that way. First, we start with the zero carbon bunker fuels, and we all know that we will need them in the future to decarbonize shipping. Then we can add a market-based measure. And in order to create a level playing field between these new fuels and fossil fuels, these market-based measures have the nice side effect um, of carbon pricing that such a mechanism raises revenues, which can then be strategically used for other additional um, reinforcing purposes. For example, research and development or and, uh, and or support to developing countries in transition and transitioning to uh, zero carbon shipping. And how could these um, uh, development, uh, developing countries be supported in their, their uh, transitioning process? Amongst others, we could think about contracts for difference here offered to developing countries to fruit uh, fuel producers there to kickstart their um, uh, zero carbon bunker fuel production. And ultimately, this would lead us once again um, to uh, more production of zero carbon bunker fuels and help us address the urgent need for zero carbon bunker fuels around the world. So just in a nutshell, yes, zero carbon shipping, decarbonizing shipping is a challenge, but it's also a tremendous business and um, uh, investment opportunity for um, uh, many developing countries. And second, let's not hesitate to think about a development-oriented virtuous cycle, a circle where the contracts um, for difference uh, analyzed by Alex and the team could enable developing countries to harness their vast potential to become the zero carbon bunker fuel hubs of the future. Thank you, Dominic, and 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 thank you for for sharing that perspective. And and it sounds sounds like the 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 role that CFDs can play in terms of unlocking these developing uh, opportunity these development opportunities in developing economies are are quite similar to the the things that that Sami as a fuel producer would need to unlock that production. We need to create the demand, and CFDs can help support that demand creation. And as you said, if the funding is raised through a carbon levy it would come at no uh, expense to the taxpayers because the funding would be raised through the industry itself. Uh, so thank you for sharing this perspective. Brian, in your initial remarks, you talked about how you were looking forward to being in a room and being able to point to a concrete, this is how you can do it, these are the tools. So now you heard from Alex, you also heard from, uh, from representatives from the industry. Do you feel ready to go into that room and, and make that compelling case? Uh, and, and, and what else needs to happen to, to really move this forward from, from outside, from a report into something that will actually impact the world? What are your reflections? Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, for engaging and for those comments. Um, Yes, I mean, I do think, um, I haven't known the shipping sector that long, but there are many of you who do know it well. And it does seem to me that a good rule of thumb is follow the money, right? So if we can provide a persuasive way in which people can tangibly see that if this policy were introduced, I would receive this money to do this thing, then I think we'll get a long way further down the track of persuading people that this isn't just sort of some green tinge. Um, minority enterprise that we're doing here. This is going to become mainstream and you need government to intervene to help you to do that transition. And if you've got that, then that guarantee for those early movers and those early projects, this will be doable. You know, these costs that you're currently looking at, which, you know, anyone commercially minded is going to look at the cost of a green ammonia um, bill and think, well, how on earth could I keep my ship commercially viable if I'm having to pay double and that's, that's with a carbon price, double uh, the price of my existing fuel. It can only come through a de-risking policy. And whether we do that at EU level or we do it at the IMO level, we've got to create that environment in which everyone, shippers who want to, can then find the support they need. And it feels to me that that, that approach by setting out that as Oxford have in a legal document that lawyers can pour over and kick the tires on, I'm hoping it will become much more concrete in the, in the shipping sector's mind. So for me, I think this is a really good uh, piece, of, uh, piece of work that hopefully, well, the work of the GMF can help socialize and all the people on this call can continue in the conversation. I, 
I hope I'm speaking for Alex and Cameron and the team when I say I don't think they feel this is a definitive statement. It's a work in working towards a socialising of an important idea. So I think everyone would be welcome would welcome feedback and, and thoughts and um, reflections uh, as the next as this project goes ahead. So um, I'm really pleased to be here and very very happy to hear everyone's comments. But I think the work of now socialising it and getting it to feel even more concrete sort of starts here. Thank you so much. And, and, and Alex, I, I wanted to turn to you because you presented and now you're here from, from the industry. And I think one question that that might come up and, and maybe you, you can answer this building on uh, on the experience from the renewable electricity is when we talk about contracts for different, is, is that something that we need to have in place for forever to, to keep this or, or is this more about the early phases? Any reflection on that and also any reflections on, on what you heard from the industry panelists and, and, and from Brian and Dominic that you want to comment on? And again, to all participants, please do put your your questions in the chat. We will uh, we'll post some of those to the panelists in a, in, a, in a few seconds. So if there's anything you really want to get uh, their their view on, please put your questions in the chat. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Casper, and, and thanks thanks everyone for your contributions. Um, on uh, how long a CFD needs to be in place, I mean, you know, in principle, the purpose is to to bring down the cost of currently very expensive technologies to the point where they're commercially viable. Um, and the the point at which a CFD is no longer necessary is somewhat of a moving goalpost, I think. I mean, it's interesting in the electricity sector, the most recent um, auctions for, for offshore wind CFDs have actually seen um, the strike price go below the cost of baseload electricity in the UK for the first time. So maybe, you know, this is the point where this is no longer needed, um, but it really does depend on, on the situation. So... Uh, if thinking about it in the shipping context, you might end up um, being able to use a CFD for green ammonia, for example, to bring down the cost of green ammonia to the point where the fuel itself is um, on a level playing field with uh, fossil fuel alternatives, but the cost of infrastructure are not being factored into that. So, um, you know, it's, it really does, it does depend on the exact fuel and the context. But in principle, once you've achieved that sort of price equalization goal, and particularly if in the interim time, carbon pricing has been applied, um, which further favours greener fuels. Um, then you know it can certainly be phased out or replaced with um, with more permanent measures. Um, I, th I think there's there's not nothing I strongly disagree with with what the panelists have said. Um, certainly, that you know a lot of the the infrastructure and technology does exist uh, already, depending on the fuel, particularly for ammonia because it's internationally traded already. Um, but indeed, that this we've 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 also come to the conclusion that it's the, the lack of um, stable demand for the product that's causing the issues in actually getting contracts signed. And that's not just for fuels; that's also for ships that are able to run on these fuels. I know, Casper, you're much more knowledgeable about exactly what's going on at the moment in the industry. But um, you're absolutely right um, to say, Sammy, that uh, you know the ETS is not sufficient. Um, not even close to sufficient at its current level, even if it doubles in price, you know, that's not going to get us there on its own. So we do need these complementary uh, measures. Um, and then finally, I just echo Bryony's uh, comment that, yes, I mean, what we've done in this report is to try and understand whether this is a viable option. And we have presented a version of, of an option that we think could be workable at the EU level in a specific format. Um, but uh, within the report itself, we've got these um, legal drafts of heads of agreement for both the fuel only and total cost of ownership versions, which are not intended to be final in any way, but more a demonstration of this is what we, this could look like in practice. And absolutely, we hope that um, that uh, legal minds in the industry will be kicking the tires on this and um, figuring out an option that does absolutely work. And if, if I may say 30 more seconds, Casper, if that's all right. Uh, just a, a couple of comments I've seen in, in the chat about um, uh, potential double CFD, uh, well, CFD overlaps when it comes to um, national economies establishing CFDs for hydrogen, for example, and then putting a shipping CFD on top of that. Yes, it's true that you might end up with cases where um, these you're essentially getting a double subsidy if you're at the right place in the supply chain, which we should be wary of. Um, but that's not to say that this won't work at all. Um, it's just a question of adapting the specific parameters to uh, to the case in hand. Thank you.
Thank you, Alex. Uh, I have a specific question to, to Sammy, but before I post that, I'll just want to warn our panelists and, and also uh, actually our participants that, that the final question I'll be asking you to comment on in about two minutes, depending on, 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 on the length of Sammy's answer is, if you could point to one thing that we should do collectively to increase the chance of having CFDs adopted, what would that one thing be? Uh, and I think for all participants, I invite you to provide your ideas in the chat. As Brian has said, this is an ongoing this is ongoing work, and and now it's about turning it and, and socializing these events and your input and ideas for how we can move this forward. Uh, and also, if you disagree and think CFDs are a terrible uh, way forward, also please do put that into the chat uh, because we'll then take that and, and use that in, in the future work. So, a couple of minutes to reflect on that. And Sammy, what I wanted to to ask you is based on, on some of the comments in the chat, is that we hear a lot of the harder to abate sectors are looking to to decarbonize using hydrogen derived fuels uh, and I know you supply you also supply ammonia to other industries agriculture and in, in chemical industries how do you see that play out are we going to be in, in, in a situation where we're going to have a lack of uh, supply to meet the demand or or will you be able to produce enough not not just Yara but but you know all energy producers energy companies how do you see that play out um, particularly from uh, from our uh, our uh, sector uh, perspective, uh, I, I would say that uh, it, it is important um, that indeed if the demand is created for a new sector, like in this case for fuels on top of uh, fertilizer, um, then in principle uh, the capacity will follow, right? So then uh, there will be expansions, and we'll see uh, lots of greenfield ammonia units located as also the, the gentleman from the World Bank said in the in the places with the most uh, competitive renewable uh, energy sources uh, right so once the snowball that was discussed here gets running uh, we see that um, uh, the, our uh, supply will catch up uh, with green demand uh, so to say uh, of course there could be there could be some uh, some hiccups uh, in between uh, but in general uh, there, there is no technology or other hurdles that uh, should uh, stop uh, supply from keeping up with demand and and it should definitely not be a reason uh, to start the first uh, vessels on, on alternative fuels uh, right because the most important thing is that uh, that we get those demonstrated thank you so if demand is there supply will follow I will ask each of you, each panelist to, to in less than one minute, because we only have seven, seven minutes le left, to, to come up with the one thing that you would like to see uh, done to, to further the chance that we will get CFDs for shipping. And Christian, can I call on you first? Yes, and I have learned that repeating the same message over and over again is always very helpful. Uh, gathering support around a uh, carbon levy, a carbon tax is key, because I think particularly when shipping, which is a global industry, uh, we will struggle to get governmental support to make contracts for difference if there is no source of funds. Um, we have many ships, they trade all over the world. We run more than 230 ships and we called uh, 624 different ports last year. So uh, even though many are Danish flag, they might not call Denmark and they will have trouble getting, getting Danish subsidies. So price on carbon. Price and carbon to pay for the CFDs. That's a very clear message. Uh, Dominic, what's your one point? Um, uh, I think that we uh, we need a proof of concept. We need a proof of concept in the shipping sector. We have it already at large scale um, uh, in the in the energy sector. Now we need it applied to the shipping sector. And here I'm not thinking particularly of the developing countries, but this is a developed countries task for be it the EU, be it the United States, be it um, uh, Denmark or so. Um, go ahead, show that it works, even order at a small scale, and um, uh, enable others uh, to follow suit. Thank you. A proof of concept, seeing that it works in practice, and one of the developed countries or regions should take the lead in demonstrating that this works. Very clear. Sammy? I would say any measure that uh, that comprises as big part of the value chain as possible, right? So that the entire value chain, all the way from fuel production uh, to, to, in a way, the cargo owner and, and the cargo gets incentivized by an uh, yeah as simple as possible measure. We should invite the full value chain so that they all have incentives to make to to play their role. I think that's also very clear, Alex. I think I'd say that this this sort of mechanism just needs a champion at the IMO. Or, uh, um, where um, these sort of mechanisms are being discussed. That might be the International Chamber of Shipping or some other body. 
but you know it's already well within the discourse of the EU, but not yet at the IMO yet. So um, there's there's a real need for kind of clear champions that are willing to socialise this idea and gather support for it if it's something they agree agree with. Sorry. Thank you, Alex. We need clear champions. Bryony, your last comment. Yeah, I, I I put mine in the chat. Um, my my sense is that engaging with the the big the big voices inside the IMO who are already edging towards this assumption that they're going to be paying a levy, uh, a carbon levy on the fuel, getting them to see that a mechanism for distributing that money is as important as the levying of the costs. Uh, it, it, you want something that's going to be effective at drawing down the costs for everyone. And uh, you don't want to be paying $100 a tonne on every fuel purchased. You want to be finding these policies, which socialise relatively high carbon prices across the whole sector, just to buy the costs down the cost curve. And if we can get people to understand that, that would be amazing. Thank you. So we need to get the, the, the big voices to understand how CFDs can actually make the, the, the transition cheaper by focusing the, the subsidies on, on, on de-risking that first move so they don't have to pay it on, on the entire thing. And, and I think that goes back to the point that, that this is just the beginning of socializing some of these ideas. I can promise on, on behalf of the Getting to Zero Coalition, and I think, Alex, I will, I will just take you in on this as well, that we will definitely be sharing and, and trying to socialize this. Uh, Alex is a co-author of a smaller, a shorter piece uh, around this that we published on the Global Maritime Forum uh, website today. So please take this and, and, and share it with whoever you think might be interested. It's a five page read. It, it's quickly done. And, and I think Alex and, and his colleagues have done a wonderful job at making that accessible. So I think with those words, I want to thank our participants for joining us today. The, the, the recording of the session will be put on YouTube, and I believe the organizers will share a link with you. So if you found this interesting and know of colleagues and others that should also have a listen, we do encourage you to share that. I would also like to thank you, our panelists and speakers. Uh, you've been wonderful and also wonderfully disciplined in keeping you to your speaking time. So first of all, thank you to Baroness Randy Worthington, to Alex Clark, to Christian Ingerslow. Dominic Engler and Sammy van den Burke. And thank you to, to the Smith School uh, at Oxford University to, to, for co-organizing this and providing such a wonderful setup. So thank you all. Uh, we have work to do, but uh, I think in this great company, I think we're, we have a chance of, of making it happen. So thank you all. Thank you, Kathy.